Good afternoon, Startup Boston and other countries too, which is pretty cool. Earlier today, we had somebody from Switzerland on. We also had somebody from China. We had Nigeria representing. This is like a totally international Startup Week crowd, and I am absolutely here for it. So I would love to kick off this event similarly by learning where is everybody dialing in from? If you could just pop into the chat, where are you dialing in from today? I'm super curious to hear if we are just a local like to Boston slash Northeast group, because I know we've got a couple of New Yorkers on our uh, panelist list here. Curious to hear. All right, we got Texas repping, Boston, of course, Chicago. What's up? You guys have great hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Newport, Rhode Island, beautiful spot to be in. Boston, Houston, love it. I'm in Cambridge personally, Cambridge, Mass, not UK. Uh, I'm not that cool, unfortunately. Very cool. And so next, I would love folks to put into the chat, what is your role in the startup world? Are you in people ops? Are you a founder or a different executive? Are you not working for a startup at all? And you're maybe just like startup curious and you're like, I don't know, I'm gonna hear some smart people talk about some stuff, right? You put into the chat, what is your role in the startup ecosystem? So I personally am coming from the people ops realm. So I'm gonna put that into the chat here. What is your role in the startup world? Innovation scouting. I don't even know what that means, but I love it. <laughs> it just sounds like a really cool job. All right, we got UX research. We got some founders, strategy. All right, very cool, very cool. Multiple innovation people. Is that like a new team? I am here for it. Like chief innovation officer sounds like such a cool title. Very cool. Okay, transitioning to startup strategy. Excellent, excellent. Founder, cool. Well, thanks so much for popping that into the chat, y'all. I am going to shortly hand it over to our lovely moderator, Alexandra. But just before I do, want to make sure folks know what are they currently dialed into. So you can see now on your screen that there are three different uh, events going off right now. You are currently dialed into Leading by Influence, how people ops professionals can get executive buy-in if you meant to be on the customer success track, serving delightful UI in B2B and B2C, or learning more about minute by minute pitching. Unfortunately, you are not in the right spot. You should click agenda at the top of your screen and navigate accordingly to your event of choice. But we are currently in the people ops track leading by influence. Awesome sauce. So one last thing before I hand it over, please, please, please ask questions. That is why we put this whole conference together. It's for learning. It's not just for me, even though selfishly, I would love to just like sponge all of the panelists' brains all the time because they're so filled with a wealth of knowledge. And when you do ask questions, please put them into the Q&A section on the right-hand side of your screen. With that, I'm going to stop sharing, and I am going to turn the reins over to our moderator, Alexandra Linares. Thank you, Allison. And hello, everybody. I, we really appreciate you jumping in and joining our discussion today. I'm Alexandra Linares. I head up talent acquisition at Brighter. We're a no-code automation company that actually started in Germany and is quickly expanding across Europe and the US. As our first people team hire in the US, I've had a really neat opportunity to dive into the people ops realm these last few months and partner really closely with our executive team. So with that, I'm really excited to be here and to learn from all of today's panelists. With that, I will pass it over to them so they can introduce themselves. Stella, do you mind kicking it off? Yeah, hi everyone, my name is Stella. I am the director of People at Pumpkin Insurance. We are a pet insurance brand and it is just as delightful as you would think it is <laughs> working in pet insurance. I joined as employee number nine and have been fortunate enough to see the company scale to 
just under 70 full-time employees, 100 overall. As the first people operations hire, I was able to really partner really closely with the executive team to build out what people at Pumpkin looks like. And today, you know, we are a team, small but mighty team of four uh, managing everything. Outside of that, I'm also the co-founder of People Method. It's a group that I started with my partner, Lexi Cantor, uh, where people operations specialists and professionals go to uh, connect with other small people operations teams uh, to have that community in a, in a role that can sometimes feel a little uh, lonely at times. Thank you so much, Stella. Also, maybe we can talk about pet insurance at a later time. Happy to. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, Winston, would you like to go next? Sure, sure. Um, thanks for having me today. Hello, everyone out there in the virtual universe. Uh, my name is Winston Tuggle. I am a director of HR business partnerships at HubSpot. Been at HubSpot for a little over three and a half years. Uh, when I joined HubSpot back in January of 2018, we we're about 1,500 employees. Now we're pushing well over 5,000 employees, um, so have um, helped seeing the company scale and helped to build out um, our HR business partnerships team. So in my role now, I manage a team of six HR business partners that oversee the uh, North American uh, Flywheel, which is our go-to-market organization. Uh, so our HR business partners are really thinking about tying people strategy with business strategy ensuring we have the right people in the right roles and that we're able to continue to scale the business. I also um, manage a small team of um, inclusion and belonging business partner right now. Um, so thinking about inclusion and belonging through the lens of human resources and how can we make sure that we have um, inclusive systems and mechanisms throughout the entire employee experience. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Look forward to sharing some insights on this panel. And again, thank you for having me. Thank you, Winston. And last but not least, uh, Melissa, would you introduce yourself? Sure, awesome. My name's Melissa. Um, I have been in the world or the business of people for now for well over a decade. Um, I've been in positions where I've scaled organizations from 50 all the way up to into the thousands. So I've learned quite a bit along the way, working with several different types of leadership teams and executive teams. I've also most recently led um, the teams that have just uh, went through our acquisition with Stack Overflow. And recently I have been doing quite a bit of um, social impact work and for philanthropy work, um, really helping non-for-profits modernize their HR practices. So I'm really excited to be sharing the stage with all of you here today so that we can share information. Thanks for sharing, Melissa. Um, it's been really great getting to meet you all through this experience, and I'm excited to share some additional knowledge today. With that, we're going to kick it in, uh, kick it off. Before we jump into exactly how to gain executive buy-in, I really wanted to start with the why. So why are people ops professionals in a unique position to drive positive influence and change within their organization? Uh, that really brings us to the meat of our conversation today. Why is it so important that we get the word out um, about our ideas and what we can bring to the table? With that, uh, Melissa, why don't you kick off that conversation? Sure. So one of the things that I think about when I was thinking about this question a bit, it was brought me to this place of, you know, our roles in people ops are cross-functional by default, right? So what that means is that we touch every single part of the organization. And what that allows us to do is to have deep insights, right? Insights where most other people are super focused on their segment in the business, we're able to offer common threads, right? And help people in the organization understand that they're not in this alone, we're in this together. The other piece that I always think about is as people ops leaders, we're really in, we're really invested in the collective success of the organization, right? Whereas some folks, and, and you know, there's no pun intended here, right? It's so some folks, like for instance, in sales, they're just so focused on getting their number and they're so focused on that one thing that sometimes things can fall from the wayside. That's where we come in and we can offer that holistic view and the collective and really sort of advocate for the collective success of the organization. That's why I think we're so uniquely positioned in a way that will, can, can make a huge difference. 
Completely agree on and have definitely experienced that at Brighter. Uh, Winston, Stella, anything you'd like to add to what Melissa said? Uh, the, the one thing I'd add, I totally agree with Melissa that we have a holistic view of the business. We're sitting across all different departments. Um, I, I think people ops professionals are typically effective listeners. Uh, and I think we're typically able to listen and empathize with people's points of views. And um, I'm not going to make an assumption that everyone isn't a great listener and empathizer because um, I don't want to say that. But at the same time, we can leverage that skill to really help drive change across the business by saying, hey, I've heard this. I think this is what's going on. Let me hear your perspective and really take that active listening approach to um, drive change throughout the organization. So I find that even if it's not even a people initiative, I find that sometimes people actually come to us as people ops professionals to help provide like an unbiased, thoughtful point of view because we have that just unbiased lens when we're approaching any problem. So I think it's um, everything Melissa said, but also just that like lens by which we look through the world typically as people ops professionals that helps us be able to drive real change in our organizations. Absolutely. How about you, Stella? Yeah, I think Melissa and Winston really hit the nail on the head. I, I feel like the only other piece that I would add to it is the reality that, you know, we're the one department within the company who focuses on culture, people, and what that means as a business. Most companies and most leaders will say it's important, but they often have competing uh, initiatives like Melissa had mentioned, and we're the one department where that is our sole purpose, uh, which puts us in a really unique position. Absolutely. Thank you all for sharing. Now that we have talked about the why, uh, that leads us to the how. So now that we understand our unique lens, how can people ops professionals really influence the executive team? And I think, uh, Stella, let's keep going with you. And if you could add on there, that'd be great. Yeah. I, you know, as Winston had mentioned, we're there to listen and to understand. And we come from a place without competing uh, goals. Oftentimes you'll hear marketing and sales are head to head because they have competing goals. And because of that, they're unable to come in as in the middle, right? That's like one department I think about often. But as people professionals, we come from a place of, okay, like, let me be the mediator or let me be your support. Like, help me understand what we're, what you're thinking and where you're trying to go. And as the person that touches every department, you're able to then piece the different pieces together to create a really unified vision and story that has that focus on culture and people and overall company wellness. Couldn't have said that better. Uh, anyone else, Melissa, anything you'd like to say there? Sure, the one piece that I'll add is um, when influencing executives, what I've learned along the way is really focusing on speaking their language. And what I mean by that is sometimes as people ops professionals, um, we tend to somewhat, somewhat sort of um, speak people ops language. And we, I would recommend that we sort of stay away from that and look at speaking the language of business. Right. And sort of saying, OK, so if I'm talking to the CFO. What does the CFO, this particular CFO, not all CFOs, because they're not all built the same. What do they care about? So that's what I typically do. I get to know my audience really, really well and then pinpoint some of the pain points that they that what they care about. And that's how I influence. I do that slowly but surely, but it's very, very effective. That's great. Uh, Winston, I saw you nodding, <laughs> so I want to make sure I give you an opportunity to speak as well. Yeah, I, I was just spot on to what everyone's saying <laughs> so far, but the, the whole idea of um, <clears throat> understanding their problems uh, and then making sure you come up with a solution that solves their problems, not your problems. Um, and Melissa talked about like under speaking their language. Uh, I find that this is very often the case that uh, people as professionals will come in and start talking about like, well, if we're going to take a performance management approach and start saying a bunch of buzzwords and the business leader on the other side is like, huh, what are you, what are you saying? Uh, and so uh, I heard someone talk about this a few weeks ago and they called it cartoon clarity. So I think we need to speak with cartoon clarity to the business to really just like not dumb it down because it's not that complicated, but like speak in normal language uh, with them to get them to understand the impact of what we're trying to do. Um, I think I think the other thing that I just want to double click on that was said a little bit here is like a 
a problems-based approach. Um, I find that oftentimes, and I do this myself, we'll come with the solution, but we don't actually know what problem we're trying to solve. Uh, and it's because we just like, oh, this thing's cool. Like, let's go do it. I want to go run with it. Um, so understanding the problem uh, and, and having a very clear point of view on the problem is critical. Um, and actually doing a little investigation on the problem before coming up with whatever it is you're trying to put forward actually allows you to put your best foot forward. Um, and then one other piece on that is data, which we didn't talk about. Um, leading, leading with data, I think, is really important. Um, I recently had a meeting with... Uh, executive team where we were talking about promotions across the organization and I was talking about how they're imbalanced and previously I would come to them and just say hey our promotions are imbalanced like see we don't have like you know the right you know level of demographics across the board here you know like, okay sure sure and they can shoot me away and we can move on with our day and they'll say they heard me but they didn't really um, but an alternative approach is saying like here's the promotion history from the past two years here's the people who are for promotion right now like, let's look at the demographic breakdown side by side of both. And I think leaders typically want to see that data. And when you show them that data, they're like, oh, OK, I see the problem. So the more we can lead with data to get them to see the problems that we're trying to solve, I think the more um, effective we can be. That was a great example. Thank you for sharing. Kind of diving even more into the details. Melissa, I would love for you to share how does someone create a persuasive business case such as like additional headcount, maybe a new analytics platform, or even like a professional review or promotion process? What are the steps to take to really get that across the line? I would say first and foremost is um, keep in mind a few things before you actually put your business case <laughs> forward. Keep in mind what stage you are in the business as a, as a startup, where investments are going. Understand, have those deep conversations with your finance partners to really figure out where are you in, in, in terms of the, the, the stage of growth before you actually put a proposal together. And then to Winston's point, which I loved, was he talked about um, identifying the problem and, and making sure that you have a, something that's more of a systemic problem that's going to also add to the business strategy. So I know I've said a lot there, but the reality is that if, for instance, if you're looking for headcount, let's say you're in town acquisition, and you're looking for headcount, right? You, you you sort of you you personally know in your mind and how you're working and how your team is working that you need headcount. That's not enough, right? So I think what you need to do is build out a a, um, a capability assessment of your team and then a capacity assessment. Convert convert those into numbers and then you can speak their language. Nine out of 10 times, every time I've done this for a CFO, I've gotten the green light. Go ahead and go do it. I don't even know how you guys are hiring so many people. Um, and, but it's because it's a language that they understand. And so that's typically what I go after. I look at those three things. That's great. Uh, as a TA leader, you're talking my language. <laughs> so I appreciate you sharing. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Stella, so Melissa talked a little bit about sort of what to think of kind of before starting that approach. I would love to hear your perspective on timeline. Like what factors should you consider when determining if it's the right time to really bring up this new initiative? Yeah, I, I think Winston and Melissa covered a lot of kind of what I believe too, which is like one, before you even start an initiative, ask yourself like, why do I want this initiative? And really understanding the why and being able to understand for myself, like what is the business impact will enable me to create the right story and the right kind of platform for me to be able to then go to my leadership team and say, hey, this is why we need to do this, this item. But when it comes to the actual timing, very similar to what Melissa said, it's it's not that people don't want to do people initiatives. Everybody wants to do right by the team. It's just when you have mounting realities of the goals that you have to hit, the addition of people work, whether it's a performance review or anything else, can just feel like a huge mountain. And so from there, I believe that it, you have to think long term. Like, what is your 18 to 24 month plan? And where does this initiative fall within it? People tend to do a lot better when you have a vision in place than just one item by one item. Hey, we need to do this one item. By the way, we now have to do this one and then this one. People tend to be a lot more receptive when you have a long range goal. 
outside of that is sometimes what we think is important just because of the lens we're coming into isn't what's important for our stakeholders. So if you have a trusted member on the leadership team that you can bounce ideas off of, don't be afraid to just say like, hey, I'm new to the org or I'm, I'm just in this new role. This is something that I'm trying to socialize within the leadership team. What do you think? Do you think this is something that they'll buy into? And that will tell you like, hey, is the leadership team ready to do this initiative this year? Or is this something that I have to sell over the next year and we implement it next year? And that's kind of how I determine timing. Great. I, I definitely appreciate your sharing. And as you can see, there's a lot of factors that go into this decision making process. Uh, what I think it's important to remember is that nobody is necessarily alone in this. Um, there, you can get help. And uh, with that, I'd really love to talk about how people ops professionals can really leverage cross functional stakeholders to strengthen their business cases and gain buy in more quickly. Melissa, um, do you mind sharing your perspective on that, really how these people ops professionals can really partner um, to kind of really move the needle? Sure. It's one of my favorite things to do, actually. Um, I think I always start with um, helping executives alleviate some pain, whatever pain that they're experiencing at the moment. It could be anything. Literally, examples I've offered people is, is someone who had a really hard time with a benefit problem, like an executive who couldn't get one of his. I know it's tiny, but what you do is you start building trust. When that person comes to you and says, Melissa, you know, I know this is not in your realm. I know that maybe someone down the line in your team can do this. I'm like, no, 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 I want to help you. Tell me what you tell me what the problem is, and I can help you go solve it. And that's how I start building trust and credibility. Um, because no job is too small for me, the way I typically, especially in a startup, I think you have to sort of get your hands into everything. Um, and then the other thing that I love to do is I pay really close attention to who has passion for specific subjects. Every single leader, if you pay enough attention, you hear some cultural things that they're, they, 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 they sort of just, they spritz it, right? They sprinkle it on. Um, and if you pay enough attention, you'll see that they have a passion for that. So you, you optimize for that and you go after it and you ask them to co-create with you. My best experience is co-creation. When you co-create an employee engagement program, a performance management program, a comp program, because what you're doing is you're pre-socializing. Literally, you're pre-socializing. And then you're also having them get skin in the game. They're not, when you go and you present and you talk about all the different steps that you've taken, more than half of your work is already done um, because they, they they have skin in the game. So I do that quite frequently and it is extremely effective if you do pay attention to what people care about in the business, which is what I think Stella talked about or Winston about being good listeners. If you listen deeply, you will find it. So th that, that those are the ways that I've actually been very successful in partnering at the executive level. Thanks for sharing. What I really love about your answer there is that's something that any people ops professional can do from day one in an organization. Uh, you know, you can start building that trust. You can really start listening, understanding what the business needs, um, and then really make that impact long term. So clearly, lots of people are changing roles. Lots of people want to come in and make an impact right away. Uh, and it's, it's great to hear that um, you don't need to wait and you can do that and jump in right away. Excellent. Stella, anything you'd like to add? No, I think Melissa did a great job. I'm just going to double, triple down on the trust aspect. <laughs> okay, excellent. Uh, I would say the next thing I'd love to get perspective on is delivery. So, you know, as is with any presentation, sort of your approach is really important. I would love to hear how you really prepare for these conversations with executives and what advice you have for other people ops professionals during their prep, um, as you would even today. Winston, could you kick us off here? Sure, sure. Some of this already is what um, has been said, but uh, um, Melissa's point around pre-socialization is the hardest thing to do because it takes a lot of time and effort, but one of the most important things you can do. 
Um, so I'm coming at it from a lens of now I work at a company with 5,000 people. And if you don't have the people in the room already aware and on, and this doesn't matter what size company you're working in, but if you don't have people in the room that already know what you're doing and presenting and sharing and excited to champion it. You're going to fail because there's going to be a million questions and a million people. I didn't know about this. What is this? Like, why, why are we doing this this way? Just because they want to have some sort of skin in the game. So pre-socializing is one of the most important things to prepare for a presentation. And um, someone said it the other day. It's like, you, it's not actually about the presentation. It's all about what you do before you go into the presentation. You already know you got buy-in before you even actually present the information. Um, the other thing is um, know your audience, know what they care about, which we talked about as well. Um, one thing I've been trying to work on myself, which is really just important and Stella touched on it a little bit is the art of storytelling. Um, if you can tell your story clearly and, you know, sometimes we just like shoot information at people, but if you have like a narrative and like, you can clearly kind of articulate going back to what I said earlier, the problem and then the solution and like what that vision is for, if you build that solution, how it will impact the company in the future, um, you're, you're really going to get people fired up about it. And I think sometimes in people operations, we don't want to think of ourselves as like marketers or salespeople, but we actually are marketers or salespeople. So um, compelling vision, compelling story, compelling narrative is going to go a long way in getting your initiative um, bought in. And then this is a tactical thing, but like running it by someone, uh, just like presenting to someone to be like, hey, does this resonate? Does this make sense? I actually um, I'm gonna call my wife out. I use her all the time because I'm like, you don't know anything about this. So I'm gonna <laughs> present this to you and I want you to tell me if it makes sense or not. Uh, and if it doesn't make sense to her, then I probably shouldn't go into a room and try to present it to a bunch of execs. So that's another <laughs> super stupid, personal, idiotic, but uh, tactical thing that can work as well. Uh, thank you, Winston. I do the same thing with my husband. <laughs> uh, just to get, as an engineer, I always love to get his perspective coming from a different angle to storytelling. So I'm um, glad we are aligned on that piece of advice. Uh, Stella, anything else you'd love to add to this topic? Yeah, one thing that I, I learned early on and that I continue to work on is stats. People love data. I think Winston was the first to talk about it. When I go into a room creating a presentation, it's one thing if I say, hey, this is important. It's another thing if I say, hey, the Bureau of Labor Statistics shows that this is what attrition looks like in the market. Because I'm speaking their language, their business language, and have credible sources behind me, they're much more likely to listen and feel engaged. And I, I believe Melissa first talked about speaking their language too. Thank you so much for sharing, and I completely agree there. Kind of moving on a little bit, talking a little bit about um, you know current day. This was something that really interested me, and I'm really excited to get others' perspective. In your opinion, how have changes in the workplace as a result of the coronavirus pandemic really helped power people ops professionals to get executive buy-in? There's no question that you know we've really stepped up as a group of professionals this year and been able to make really tremendous impact, uh, but would love to hear about your own experiences and any advice you have for others. And with that, um, Stella, would you like to kick that off? Sure, I, you know, this coronavirus pandemic, I can, I'll be the first to say, I've never experienced anything like it. We've had to be incredibly agile quick on our feet and make really difficult decisions that affect a large number of people very quickly with very little to no guidance. And one thing that I noticed in this is for the first time in a long time, the spotlight was on us. People looked to, to us for questions. We were no longer HR, the people who do performance reviews and the people who make sure that the ship is running. We were looked at as a strategic partner. And I really think that that's really changed the narrative. I know there's a movement towards people operations and people operations being a more strategic partner within the business. But this was one area where we were able to spearhead and, and have a spot, spotlight on us. And I think most of us, if not all of us, have made good decisions. We've been able to show the business that, hey, when you involve us early on, like we can affect change whether it's from attrition throughout this pandemic, making sure people are safe. Like, I really believe that this pandemic has shown how important this function is within a business. Absolutely, thank you for sharing. Winston, how about your experience at, at HubSpot? What have you felt and anything you can share for others? Yeah, um, everything Stella said, which is like, you know, I think it's funny. I've gotten this profession because I'm passionate about the impact that we can make on businesses. So I knew it. 
I don't think most people knew it. And I think COVID, as, as awful as the last two years has been, um, it's actually been an opportunity for people operations to really step up. Um, as Stella mentioned, to be like, look what we, this is what we do and you need us more than ever right now. And so I think people have uh, leaned on us a lot. I think the one thing I'd add is um, <clears throat> innovation, right? Like the, the innovation in our space is at a remarkable pace right now. And a lot of us, including us at HubSpot with like hybrid work and um, some of our diversity, inclusion and belonging initiatives, like we're in uncharted territories. We're, we're not doing things that other people have done before. There's no book that tells you how to um, handle all of the different crises and situations that we're facing or a great resignation or whatever it may be. Um, and so I think it's really cool to be on the forefront of ideas. And like the thing I would encourage any people ops professionals to do is like wild ideas should be brought to the table. Because now's the time, because no one actually has the solution. We all act like we know what we're talking about and know what to do, but like, you know, you, you've never been in a global pandemic before. So you don't know what decisions you make now how they will impact the business six months to a year from now. Um, so I guess like just innovating, coming up with crazy ideas, doing new things, thinking outside of the box, and especially for startups. They're so nimble um, and so agile. Like right now is the time to differentiate yourself by doing something that no one else is doing. Um, it will help you stand out in some way. Completely agree. Thanks for sharing and I encourage everybody to bring that creativity to their roles and certainly share what they're doing uh, with their peers. Before we move on to the last question, I do want to encourage anybody who has a question to put it in the chat. And then we do have one question here that I'm going to publish so we can chat about. Listening is definitely a critical skill for people partners. However, problem solving in a fast paced environment can make it harder. How do you balance solving for your customer and delivering results versus listening, reflecting, gathering other perspectives on the best solution before acting? Anybody like to jump in with a response here? I do. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Melissa. No, go ahead. You can go ahead. You, you, you are first. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. Hey, hey, Anna. I know Anna. Uh, nice to see that you're on the call. Um, so. I think it's a it's an art. It's not a science, right? Um, again, I think we are in unprecedented territory where we are doing things that we haven't necessarily done before. Um, I don't think you should ever do anything without listening or testing. Uh, you don't have to listen or test and have the full result. Um, so I think there needs to be some understanding of the problem and some like either testing by just telling people this is what we're going to do, what do you think is going to happen, or piloting something in a very quick, you know, agile pilot to see what the, the response is and then launching it. Um, but there's always going to be an element of risk. Uh, and in my opinion, um, this is just my point of view, like you just have to weigh the risk and be willing to take it on and being able to pull back things when they aren't the right things and adapt things uh, to make them better. So, um, a little bit of listening has to happen up front, but I think you can get bogged down if you want all the data and want to think through all the scenarios because in a fast paced company, especially like HubSpot, you're never going to have all of the different answers in front of you and you kind of have to just take on that risk. Completely agree. Melissa, would you like to add on there? Yeah, what I was going to say was um, all of what Winston just shared, um, specifically around piloting and trying things out. The one thing I will say is, at least for me, I prioritize listening. So what, what is prioritized gets done, right? So I make it a point to prioritize listening because what happens is as people, we're just, it's human nature to, you know, fall into these flawed assumptions, thinking you look at patterns, you think that the patterns mean X, Y, and Z, and you start making these flawed assumptions instead of sort of really carving out the time to listen. And we're not ta we're not saying listening tours of like, you know, three months, five months, we're talking about just carving out the time that day, that moment, to really listen to something that's holding people back back from doing their work and being their best selves at work, right? So I do think it's, you have to prioritize it and I would highly recommend to prioritize it, test, pilot, take the risk, go for it. Not everything's gonna be perfect, but that's why you iterate, right? You make it better along the way. So those, those are my thoughts. 
Completely agree. I would say it's one of my favorite things about joining a high growth company is that you can experiment uh, and evolve. Learning is really important and, you know, constantly trying new things and figuring out with that feedback how to make it better. So hopefully we can all continue that as we move to that next stage of growth. Now, we've given a lot of great ideas today uh, and really want to make sure that we're giving our audience some resources as they move on in their people ops careers. So the last question that we have on the docket for today is, you know, really what resources can people ops professionals look to increase their business acumen and ability to influence? So, you know, lots of great ideas today. Where can we go next? And to kick it off, how about Stella? We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, I, I'm somebody that joined people operations later in their career. I started in marketing, was in talent acquisition, and was thrown into the world of HR in my current role. So I resonate with this question so deeply. I'd say that there's the tried and true SHRMs uh, of the world. There's also vendor sites that I find a lot of information like Lattice and Lever. But the area that I find the most influential and and the places that I look at first to find information that will help me be a better leader in the people ops space are sites like uh, Harvard Business Review. I love McKinsey. I find that they have some really great articles out there related to people operations and people operations adjacent that I find incredibly helpful. There's also a lot of innovative ideas in both those channels. Uh, the last one is it's funny, but I love browsing the Bureau of Labor Statistics. It's one of my guilty obsessions. I go on there to look at, hey, what is unemployment looking like? What does high tech, as they call it, like how is the industry doing? And I find that having some of those numbers in my back pocket actually enables me to help make better people decisions. I think outside of that, uh, you're not in this alone. I, I talk to a lot of HR professionals who talk about how lonely this world can be, especially when you're the leader of in a company. And so I would highly encourage folks out here to join groups where other HR professionals are. Uh, you'll be pleasantly surprised to see if you're not already a part of these groups that there are a lot of people out there solving the same exact questions that you are. And you don't always have to recreate the wheel. There are people out there who are willing to share resources, templates, anything you can think of out there um, to support you. Uh, the POPs channel, People Geeks, uh, People Method, uh, RANS Slack group are some of the groups that I'm a part of that I find to be really helpful. Thanks so much, Rochella. I'm jotting down notes. <laughs> Those are all great examples. So thank you. Uh, since we have a couple minutes left, I would love, this is kind of off the cuff, but I would love to go around and kind of give a last piece of advice or tip um, I think, you know, really appreciate everybody coming out today and just kind of a last piece of confidence or a tip as people kind of go about and really work on getting this executive buy and moving forward. Um, I'll kick it off um, since this was my idea, but I feel very lucky to just work for a company that really empowers me to bring my ideas to the table. And, and that starts with confidence in yourself. And so um, I would say regardless of your title or role in your organization, raise your hand, um, have the dialogue, you know, pe people want to hear from you. Uh, and it all starts by just, you know, by just putting yourself at the table. Uh, so don't hesitate if you have a, a great idea. Um, somebody will listen and uh, who knows what it could turn into. Uh, with that, Melissa, anything you'd like to share? Thinking about this a little bit, but I was also trying to listen to you as well. So. <laughs> Um, it was a bit of a challenge, I'll admit. Um, so for me, I would say take the risk. And what I mean by that is when you're afraid to present to a team or you're afraid to um, actually propose an initiative, that's when you should do it. And the reason you should do it is because it's worthwhile. Um, I have to tell you my experience, um, 
I've taken lots of risks. And I mean, I came through HR when HR wasn't as strategic or people focused or data focused. I've always had that lens of data. Um, just take the risk, go for it. The worst answer that you can get is no. It's okay to get a no. You grow from a no, right? And you sort of ask why behind the no so that you can grow more. So that to me would be my one piece of advice, take the risk, you never know the reward. Thank you for sharing and agree there. Uh, how about you, Winston? Yeah, um, everything that you all said already. Um, one other, this is kind of similar, but like be the, be the, know you're the expert in the room. I say this to my team a lot. And I think sometimes we're like, well, I don't know, you know, SAS economics as well as, you know, the people in the room. I'm like, yeah, you don't know SAS economics as well, but you, first of all, you know enough to be dangerous, so be confident in yourself. And second of all, you know everything about like human dynamics and how people show up and the people in the room don't. Um, so know what you know and be confident in what you know and go into the room and, and share it. And I think that um, also means like have a point of view. Uh, one thing I'm working on myself is like sitting back and just like hearing people's perspective and reacting to that is one thing. But coming, we all have ideas. We all have perspective. And so share that perspective because even if it's like, no, that's terrible. Um, it might actually further someone else's idea or further co the collective idea. So um, have a point of view and be willing to share it. Um, and then the the last one is just like, don't stop learning. Um, keep trying to learn from different sources. Stella shared a bunch of great resources that she uses and going to panels like this one is a great way to just get little tidbits of information. So keep the learning journey going forever because things are always gonna change. Yes, agreed. Uh, and how about you, Stella, to close it out? And then also, if you would be so kind as to add the channels and groups you recommended, uh, everybody would love to, to have that back here. <laughs> yeah, I, oh man, like the three of you have named pretty much everything that was on my list, which is great. I, I would say the one thing that I often struggle with a bit, and this kind of touches on a lot of the things that the three of you have mentioned is imposter syndrome. Like sometimes when I don't know the answer to something, I kind of crawl into a bit of like a hole where I'm like, oh man, how can I be a, a leader when I don't know all these things? And it's really easy to be really hard on yourself. And I think in those instances, just remembering that we're all human, especially in HR, you're not going to know everything. That's not what matters. It's what you do to find out the right information and, and to what you're going to do next. I think that's my biggest piece of advice. You're going to find that you don't know a lot of things, but that's perfectly okay. So I did pop on screen here because for whatever reason, MCs can't add questions into the Q&A. I was like, I have a great question. Um, so sorry to let in, but I'm back, but temporarily. So um, first, Stella, I know that um, somebody in our Q&A, Eli, would love to know those groups. So if you could pop those into the chat, that would be awesome. But my question, well, it's also probably geared more towards Stella than Winston, just because coming from the earlier stage people ops lens, uh, right now rolling with a people team of two, three if you include our senior tech recruiter, but he's really on the talent side of the people and talent bucket. Um, and so I'm curious to hear, you know, when startups are starting to get to that inflection point of having done all of the tactical things so long for so long, you know, and making that shift from like, okay, we've got our benefits set up. We've got our ATS implemented. We've got an HRIS and, you know, those kind of like baseline needs to where you can actually start to figure out your people ops roadmap and some of that strategic stuff. How are you, or maybe thinking back to earlier roles for Melissa and Winston, when you were in smaller teams, like how are you juggling the tactical with the strategic. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in since this is very much my world, as you mentioned, Allison. I think the thing is, is you can put these baseline items in place, but they're never going to be fully fleshed out. Like what you need as a 50, less than 50 person startup is going to be very different than what you need at 100, 150. So I think having items that are sometimes what I would say a band-aid fix is completely okay. But being able to have the scalability aspect in mind, and that's kind of where that 18 to 24 month plan comes in, is going to be key. I would say being able to balance the two, it's 
sometimes it just means you have to sit down and do it. <laughs> I wish there was something else that I could say here, but uh, enabling people on your team also is going to be something that's important. I think for myself personally, it's really easy for me to jump in and say, I have to do everything myself. When in reality, I should be, hey, I'm facilitating and I'm giving people the tools to do what they need. And so even if I didn't have an HR team, which I did it for a really long time, I was able to mobilize my leaders, my individual contributors to do some of the work to just spread the love. Because at the end of the day, recruiting people, culture, all the things that fall under the people ops umbrella is owned by people operations, but it's everyone in the company's responsibility. So sometimes it's just being a good leader and being good at delegating as well. Thanks, Stella. Uh, Winston or Melissa, anything you'd like to share from previous experiences? I mean, for me, it's just what Stella mentioned, specifically around leveraging people in the organization to help move you move your tactics and strategy forward is extremely critical. Like in co-creation, I think, I think co-creation people don't really. It, 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 yes, you own people ops, but you should be co-creating so everybody has skin in the game. because then people are not questioning. So I do think that leveraging everybody in the organization is super critical. Um, it's a, in my opinion, a critical success factor for, for anyone in the role um, and not working in a vacuum, no matter what size you are, right? You can be, you can be 50, you can be 100, you can be 5,000 and actually leverage people in the business to help you. I think you'll be really, really super successful. Great. Uh, Winston, any final words before we wrap up today? Uh, on that point, the only thing I'd add is saying no, uh, figuring out how to say no. And Stella talked about the 18 to 24 month roadmap of like priorities, building that out so you can anchor to that to say, no, we can't do that right now. Because whether you're in a startup, scale up or enterprise company, there's going to be a million requests that come to a people ops org and you need to figure out how to uh, fall back on what you've committed to so you don't run in a million different directions. Agreed. Uh, well, I know, I know we are at time. Uh, Allison's coming to tell me this. Uh, I just wanted to personally thank all the panelists uh, for their time today and everybody who hopped on to listen. And then my final plug is uh, I hope you'll all stay on. Our next People Ops track is coming up at 315 through thick and thin, how to engage and retain employees through challenging circumstances. Um, obviously, it's been a challenging time during the pandemic, so I'm sure there's a lot of great advice there, and I hope you'll all participate. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. You can always you. navigate at the top here by clicking into agenda to get en into any of the uh, sessions, yeah. especially the one that Alexandra just mentioned. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.